And as you see, I uh, have a few logos up here. This is just a handful of the places over the years that I've had uh, interviews of various types. And uh, again, once you get to the point where people are actually, uh, people in the media actually know you're out there, uh, you may get uh, requests from all sorts of places, both large and small. I just have a small sampling of the larger places that uh, have uh, contacted me over the years. And some that may be rel relatively well known around the world is uh, CNN and BBC. But I've also uh, had China Radio International call me out of the blue one day. And Fox News on several occasions, Al Jazeera at least a couple of times, and CBS Radio. And for those of you who are not in Canada, that uh, reddish uh, round ball in the lower left corner, that is from CBC. Here's a basic question. A question you should ask yourself. Why become an on-air on expert? Everyone has a different reason for doing so. Among them could be to inform the public, become prominent in your field, to attract and build your audience for something else you may be doing either online or offline, to promote your organization or your efforts, uh, and to get more on our opportunities. And I don't want to go into great detail about that, but the best way I've found to get invited to speak on air is to speak on air. Uh, somehow or another, uh, the media world has their own internal databases to find out who's doing what online and in the newspaper and radio and TV. So if you start being interviewed, you'll start, uh, in my, my experience has been, you'll start getting requests from all over the place. In my case, I also have significant uh, online uh, content from websites, blogs, etc. over the last 17 years, as it turns out. So I've uh, done a variety of things to attract attention to myself. But again, in the modern era of the Internet, it's not necessary to have a full slate of online and offline uh, promotional activities in order to get the attention of the media. Now, you may ask, given what we have here with the current state of the Internet, with all the various sorts of options people have to like, get information online. Why is it still important to be on the air? Well, the biggest reason is that traditional media is still very important. Uh, without going into great detail, most large media organizations are run either by extremely large corporations or by governments with essentially uh, extremely large amounts of funding. So if uh, for some reason they want to get their message out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, they're able to do so. Uh, in thick or thin, no matter what the, uh, the financial situation may be for that company, unless the company goes completely bankrupt. And more to the point, these large media organizations often have outlets in a variety of media. Uh, some of them would have everything from blogs and, and online videos to uh, radio and television networks and printed, printed media. So again, if you can break through and get to one of the higher levels of media for these uh, corporations, for these entities, then you have a good chance of catching the attention of a lot of media organizations. Also, getting on the air is probably the most difficult thing to do. That is, uh, there's uh, although there are many media outlets out there, there are literally thousands, tens of thousands of potential experts in fields all over the world who can be on as an on-air expert. And in a sense, you're competing with all of those people. If you're able to systematically get yourself to a point where you are on uh, on the air or being quoted in media in some way, this uh, sort of technique, this sort of process can be duplicated for other kinds of media. For example, if you're good enough to figure out how to get on CNN and BBC on a regular basis, you will probably be good enough to figure out how to get into your, your professions, professional journals or professional media magazines, internal media magazines, rather, on a regular basis. Now, let me saying aside right here, the expertise and the habits you have to get into to be on major media can be quite different from the expertise you need to get, for example, in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, although expertise in one can help you in the other, just because you're doing one very, very well doesn't automatically mean you can go over and do the other. There are certain ways that the media works. There are certain ways that the Internet works where if you go with that flow, that is, if you take advantage of the system and the situation that, that exists right now, you have a better chance of being in the media. Also, once you do become an on-air personality, it can enhance anything else you might be doing, whether it's with major media, whether it's with internal media within your company, within your profession, etc. And it can support other objectives that have nothing to do with what you happen to be saying on, online or on the air. 
And again, um, people come into the media for various reasons, some of them personal, some of them for issues and purposes larger than, than themselves. For whatever reason you do want to get online and get on, on the air, rather, you still have to go through certain steps. You still have to jump through certain hoops to get to the attention of those who make those decisions. Now, you might ask yourself, how big is the opportunity? How hard is it to get online, or get on, on the media, get on, on the air, get on radio? Well, here's a very simple thing you can think of. Just think, in your own experience, all the various news outlets that exist 24 hours, seven days a week. Of course, some of them are known worldwide, like Al Jazeera, CNN, BBC. But in the current media landscape, depending on what country you're in, you may have a number of nationally broadcast entities especially on cable television and satellite television, which are broadcasting 24 hours a day, as well as many large cities may have 24-hour news channels uh, dedicated to local and regional news, not to mention the many specialty channels that might be out there. For example, the Weather Channel is obviously broadcasting weather-related information all the time. Sometimes they have news segments. Sometimes they have segments where they have experts coming on. And outside the U.S., of course, you have national organizations like CBC, uh, Radio China International, et cetera, which uh, again, they could be broadcasting in the language of that country or like Radio Channel China International, they could be broadcasting in English as does Al Jazeera English. So depending on what you wanna do, there may be many, many opportunities for you. Now we know there's opportunity as far as various channels out there for radio and television. How much time is available? Again, this is a fairly straightforward math problem. There are 24 hours in every day, 168 hours in every week, a little over 10,000 minutes in every week. It boils down to roughly half a million minutes per year. So multiply the number of media outlets, international, national, media, uh, local, regional, etc. Multiply that by 500,000 and divide that by three. Why three? Well, when you figure in commercials, uh, repeat broadcast, on-air personalities making jokes for one another, maybe one-third of the time, if we're lucky, there's actually news going on. But still, take those numbers of minutes. You can easily see there are literally millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of minutes around the world available. And these are minutes that have to be filled up with something every day of every week. That something can be you, but only if you do the things to get yourself to the attention of those who make those decisions. Also, the number and type of news outlets are evolving. I don't have to tell anyone who's been around for a few years. Uh, once upon a time, maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, and a little over 30 years ago, there was no 24-hour news channels like CNN. In the United States and elsewhere, if you had news at all, you either had specialty news shows that came on once a week, like 60 Minutes, or you might have the afternoon or early evening national news broadcast. Local television stations had the equivalent. We're talking about limited numbers of outlets with limited numbers of minutes per day. Fast forward to what we have today, hundreds of uh, cable television channels around the world, satellite channels, etc. What's tomorrow going to bring? I don't know, but it's going to be different from today. It's very likely traditional media that exists right now, radio, television, cable, satellite, television, will still exist. But there may very well be many alternatives out there from entities like Netflix coming up with a news channel for all we know. Smaller entities having 24-hour uh, news channels that are that have worldwide reach. And again, the future will be somewhat different from today, but it's very likely that the traditional media that is, exists now will also exist in the future. So if you have the skills and the experience now for traditional media, it will probably work at some level at whatever comes in the future. You might ask yourself, why would anyone want me to be on television or be on the radio? Well. First of all, they need experts for various reasons, because when a story comes up, be it a breaking news story or an ongoing story about some subject, the reporters that are out there right now are not experts in everything. Now, in the old days, 20 or 30 years ago, the major news organizations could actually afford to develop very, very well-educated, very expert reporters in very narrow areas so they could be their go-to person, let's say, on, on the space program or on military and defense issues, etc. But as uh, time has worn on and the media has radically changed landscape, 
to the point where newspapers, as we used to know them, don't exist anymore. Major newspapers are getting rid of whole areas of expertise. I just read the other day about, the, I think it's the Chicago Sun-Times, got rid of their entire photography staff, gave all their reporters iPhones, and gave them basic, basic lessons on how to take pictures with an iPhone. And we have uh, even national news organizations who uh, no longer have as many of the very well-respected, very well-educated reporters that they used to for a bunch of reasons. The biggest being that a lot of the news organizations that exist right now, while still very prominent, aren't as profitable as they used to be. So they have to make changes. Also, a very basic human reason for this, live experts are more appealing. The average viewer, the average listener would actually rather listen to a real live human being speaking about something rather than a recording of some expert from months or years ago. Why else would anyone want you? Because, again, if you take to heart some of the things I'm saying today, you'll be taking actions that will get attention. You'll be taking actions that might allow someone to think about, hey, let me call this person or send this person an email, see if they have something to offer. Also, because the price is right. With rare exceptions, those rare exceptions being folks who might have a specific contract with a network or what have you, most on-air experts aren't paid. So the price is right for these news organizations to get you. You get something out of the deal, you get exposure for yourself or for your organization or for your work. They get something out of the deal. They get stuff on television or on the radio that encourages the audience to stick around past the next set of commercials. For the vast majority of media, especially in North America, the media is a profit-making enterprise and uh, commercials are what drive everything else. Even for those that are not a commercial commercially oriented uh, organization, they still are driven by ratings. That is, they would like to have people watch. They'd like to have people listen. They want to do those things that will allow that to happen. On-air experts are one of those things. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, gosh, it would be really great to be on TV and radio all the time. Well, let's stop for a second. You got to ask yourself, do you just want to be on TV or radio once? We've all seen all sorts of very crazy things on television or heard very crazy things on the radio where you have a one-shot wonder, someone going viral because they did something incredibly ridiculous, silly, interesting, heroic, whatever. That's all very fine and good if you want to be on one time only. If that's what you're into, save yourself some time, stop listening to this webinar. Because my attitude here is your goal isn't to get on radio or television once, but to get on dozens of times over a number of years. Also, the goal has to be something greater than being on the air. That is, uh, it would help if you're driven by something that goes beyond whatever short-term, even long-term joys and benefits you get from being on the air. And also, you have to balance this against the rest of your life. Is this going to be worth the effort? No matter how little it costs you in money, it will cost you something in time and effort to do this sort of thing. And if you spend time doing this, which is trying to get on the air, you have an opportunity cost of what you could be doing with your time, with your energy. If you think it's worthwhile, keep going forward. If not, maybe you should do something else. If you're on the fence, listen to the webinar, then afterwards see if it's something you want to do. And uh, the big thing, or at least a big thing for me, is do you have an approach that's sustainable? Uh, if you want to be an on-air expert, this is not something that will be happening 24 hours a day. Even the most outrageous Hollywood star you can think of someone who ends up in the tabloids all the time. I'm sure they're working hard at it, but even they are not doing it 24 hours a day or even 40 hours a week. It takes a lot of work, even for someone who spends their entire life trying to be in front of the camera, to be in front of the camera, because again, there's a lot of competition out there. Now, there are eight parts to a sustainable effort, and this is something that isn't just for media. This is sort of a, a model I use for any sort of ongoing organized activity sort of like a checklist for a project or checklist for an ongoing business. That is, there are a lot of things that you have to consider. And if you have a checklist where you at least cover the major parts, it doesn't guarantee that you'll be successful at whatever that endeavor is, but it will guarantee that you will have at least spent some time thinking about the larger issues that you have to cover. One of them, what's your goal or your mission? That is, you have to have a mission to make you excited about it, to make the people around you excited about what you're doing, and also to uh, give the people who may want you on the air a reason to have you around. Again, if your mission is, I just want to be on television or the radio, 
it's unlikely you'll get a whole lot of people uh, gravitating towards your, your efforts. Also, who's leading this effort? If it's just you talking about your skills, your experience, your expertise, well, obviously you're gonna be the leader. If you're doing this because you're part of some larger effort, let's say it's part of a corporate outreach where as a member of that corporation, you're trying to get the corporation in front of the media in a good way. And either you're chosen as a representative or you go out of your way to become a sort of representative. Well, you might be leading the effort. It could be someone higher up in the food chain is doing this. Who's on your team? And that's not as simple a question as it may seem, because your team, as we'll see later, can include other people. It can involve technology. That is, uh, entities that you may have control over or you may have some ongoing interaction with, and other things which you may have a very indirect interaction with, but which could be vital for you getting on the air. Another thing, what will it cost? And again, as I said earlier, it's not about money. It's also about time. It's also about effort. It's also about the opportunities you're foregoing by doing this. And if it's something where you have to have an ongoing expenditure of resources, be those resources, money, time, etc., you have to budget for those. And if you don't think you can budget that, well, maybe it may not be a worthwhile effort. How do you manage communications? And again, communications in the broader sense. Obviously, if you're on the air, you're communicating with an audience. But getting up to that point, you're also communicating with the team members, whoever they may be. You're communicating with your audience, your ongoing audience, who are going to be there whether or not you're on TV or not. And you could be communicating even with yourself. That is, are you setting things up so that you yourself can have a consistent effort? That is, you yourself can have a consistent way of going without jumping too far ahead. One of those communications could be, do you have your own set of checklists and procedures, however short, that you use to make sure that you have a consistent product? In this case, you in front of the camera or you in front of the microphone on a regular basis. What systems will you use? And again, this is the age of the internet, but the systems don't always have to be online. They don't always have to be technological. Some of those systems could be procedures and checklists. Some of those systems could be rules that you and the people you work with abide by. What are the legal issues? Well, we have the obvious legal issues of saying something on uh, television or the radio that can get you arrested, but there are also more subtle legal issues you have to think of. That is, if you want to have an ongoing, sustained effort, how much control do you want to have over the material you might produce in the process of going on on the air? That is, not necessarily what you say on the air, but all the background work that goes into being in a position where people are looking for you. And finally, what will you say? Why do I put this last? It's real simple. You don't take care of the other things. It's unlikely thing here. And it's also unlikely you would have gone through the thinking process necessary to have uh, something significant to say. Now, I do have my first hand up. Let me check the entire list. Yes, I have a hand up. And Stephen, I'm going to unmute you. And you will be heard by the entire audience. Stephen, thanks for uh, being with us today. I was wondering about... Up. About Skype, what, how, do you recommend Skype, uh, Todd? Well, I'm glad you mentioned Skype because that's going to be coming up in my basic tool set that I recommend that people have available to them when they uh, try and do uh, media work. And there are various reasons for that, and I'm glad you asked that question and reminded me. I'll get into it in more detail later on. Uh, what's the goal? What's your mission? Being on the air isn't just enough, right? What is a mission in the sense of how do I define the mission? Well, one of the things I like to say to people is, can you say it in a few words? That is, is it something where you don't have to memorize it like, let's say, the Gettysburg Address, but it's something, you know, the old joke about 25 words or less? Is it something that you can say almost in your sleep? Is it something that's easy to remember? Is it something that encompasses the main reason that you're doing this thing? Now, in my world, uh, one of the things I do, as many of you know, is I run airsafe.com, which is an aviation uh, safety and security website. And one of the, the founding foundation of that site, the mission of that site, is to provide the public with useful information. In this case, useful information about aviation safety and security. So that mission is great for me and for the people I work with because whenever we come across something like, well, gee, should we be doing this? It's like, does it fit within the mission, yes or no? If it does, you might want to go ahead with it. If it doesn't, maybe we shouldn't touch this at all. What your mission is, what your greater goal is, is up to you. 
But again, if you don't have some sense of greater purpose, just being on the air is not going to be enough. Because if that were the case, any opportunity to get on the air, even one that puts you in a ridiculous light, would be a welcome opportunity. But it may not be good for you in the long run. And another basic measure I, I, I say to myself is, you know, if we do this thing, if it, it's keeping with the mission, does it increase the good or decrease the bad? That is, are we making life better somehow or avoiding pain for people somehow? And making life better could be any number of things. In my case, it's giving information about aviation accidents that allay people's fears or at least put their concerns in such a way that they can deal with it in the short term. And also, does your mission motivate you and your team? Again, here's an example of a bad mission. I want to make a whole lot of money, and I want to be on TV to promote whatever my product is. Well, making a whole lot of money might, in fact, influence your team and motivate your team. But if making money were your goal, the next person to come along who can offer them even more money would mean your team will dissipate, disappear, and you'll have to start all over again. And again, the goal is to have a sustained effort that you can carry on for months, years, or even decades. And having some sense of mission helps that. Who's in charge? Well, it depends on the situation in your organization. Uh, if it's just you, it's very easy to know who's in charge. You can't foist the, re off, uh, the responsibility on someone else or blame someone else for failure if it doesn't work out saying, oh, the internet is not working for me. Well, if you're the only person, you're the leader. If you have other people working for you, it can be a bit more complex. For example, within an organization, you might have someone who is on paper the leader, has the title of a leader, but couldn't lead their way out of a paper bag. And really, they are not invested in the success or failure of your effort. And they might uh, help you, they might hurt you, they may be indifferent. And in any case, uh, the leader might be something other than the person who is your, your manager or the vice president or what have you. But again, that's more of an organizational dynamic thing. What I am trying to say is this. If you're going to do this, whether it's for yourself or for someone else, you better identify who's the leader, who has both responsibility and authority over this, and who will benefit from the success and not benefit from the failure. And in general, and this is, uh, I'm not going into organizational theory here, but the fewer people you have in leadership positions, the easier it is to handle. Or put another way, the fewer people you have who can overrule the uh, decisions of some of the leadership, the easier it might be for you. And again, uh, without going too much into the theory of corporations, you have to have some sort of agreement up the chain of command that what you're doing is good. So that if it reaches to the higher level of the chain of command, they become aware of what you're doing. If it fits the organization's mission, if it puts the organization in a good light, they might be all for it. But if that's not the case, well, your time on the air could be very short and not very pleasant. Who's on your team? The team includes people both inside and outside of the media. Obviously, whoever is going to book you to be on the air is part of the team, even if they're just part of the team long enough to book you on the air. These are the people you're going to be working with, either part-time, over months and years, to make your effort a success. While reporters, the people who are asking you the questions on the air are important, so are the producers who might be doing the legwork to get you and other experts on the air. So could the people who might be in the studio who are winding their mic together because, again, they're all there to help you and to help the organization put something good on the air. And anytime you can help them with their job, make their job easier, the easier it is for you. Now, your team will even include your competition because, let's face it, if you've never been on TV, never been interviewed on the radio before, uh, there's going to be a first time to do that. It's not going to be a first time. It'll be a first time for you, but not the first time for that radio or TV station. They've had experts on before. Some of these experts might even be people in your profession, in your field, you know, in your hometown. Reach out to these folks. They're your competition in the sense that, yeah, if uh, they had to choose two people and they're going to choose you or the other person, they might choose a more expert person, the one with the more time. In, in the seat. But these are people who have also been there. These are people who can give you pointers, the nuances of what to do and what not to do in order to be successful. Wouldn't hurt to reach out to them. It would help even better if they were working with you along the way. If you're doing this as part of an organization, work with the relevant parts of your organization. 
and it may not be just the people within your uh, work group or within that particular area of expertise. As I'll get into later, you may by necessity have to work with other parts of the corporation that have nothing to do with your expertise in order to make sure you're not running afoul of any company guidelines. And the team members aren't necessarily people you'll know. There may be a lot of people out there who will be working on your behalf, who you will never meet, who will never phone. You'll never have an email exchange with them. You won't even send Twitter messages to them. They might know about you and your work and might do things on your behalf, but you'll never know that, which is why it's important, as I'll get into later, to have a presence online and elsewhere that allows uh, people who are producers, allow people who are researchers, the opportunity to know who you are, what you're about, what you've done. What's the cost? As I said before, money is just one cost. The time spent is valuable, and that's also a cost. And by the way, it's a two-way street. It's a time spent by other people as well. People who are going to listen to you on the air. Also, people who might be looking for you. Again, getting back to those producers and researchers I've talked to you about. If it takes someone 10 seconds to find a particular expert on the Internet, but it would take them 60 seconds to find you, who are they likely to call first? So again, having an online presence that is uh, reasonable to the point that it becomes easy for people to find you is a very valuable thing. As far as extra equipment and all that, you're very likely to have the basic technologies already in hand. I'm assuming that anyone listening to this has either a laptop, a desktop, or a mobile device. If you bought any of those in the last couple of years, they probably come equipped with all the things you would need to research things on the internet, to even do uh, an on-camera or on-the-air interview from where you're sitting right now. Uh, Stephen, I believe it was, mentioned uh, Skype earlier. Skype is one of those basic technologies which are free, which also gives you a certain kind of technological leverage. That is, if you are uh, want to talk with someone around the world, on the other side of the world, rather, and you don't want to spend any extra money, if that other person has Skype, you have Skype. You can not only have an audio conversation, you can have a video chat back and forth. The kind of capability that was only within the realm of kings and plutocrats and governments 20, 25 years ago is now in your hand, probably right now. A lot of additional cool, uh, tools out there are either free or very low cost. For instance, right now I'm uh, doing this on a, uh, a laptop. In fact, it's a, uh, a MacBook Air from a couple of years back, so it's not the most modern MacBook Air. And the one extra device I bought, I bought a $20 microphone, which I use for doing podcasts, a very small little thing on the side of my computer. That's the only extra thing I have. Everything else I came with the machine. When I said timing is critical, there are several kinds of communications that are taking place, that take place in what I do with airsafe.com. Like I said before, they're the team members, they're the audience. I happen to have websites, and for years I've also had a podcast, I've had a YouTube channel, etc. That's one kind of communication. But a key kind of communication I have is notifying, getting notified rather, when something newsworthy happens. My area of expertise happens to be aviation safety and security. And when planes crash or when some other major thing is happening, live on CNN or on some other media network, it, it, it could be a matter of minutes between either getting a call, not getting a call, being aware and doing things necessary to get attention to myself and being left out in the cold. So there are things that I do that allow me to be informed. One of the many things I do, and I'm jumping ahead here, is I use the Internet itself to give me a heads up. Now, I love Google because a lot of the things they have are free. One of the things they have is something called Google Alerts. I uh, played around with Google Alerts. I don't know if any, any of you have. But one of the things it does is if a certain set of keywords pops up, it'll send you an email saying these keywords have popped up. Sometimes I get notified of plane crashes or stories about plane crashes or things that are written about um, by particular people in my email. Twitter is another sort of tool like that. I have a Twitter account. Sometimes I follow it. And if I'm looking for a particular issue, that is, I hear something has happened in some far off country. I do a search on particular hashtags that might give me insights into that event. And many times I see a tweet that has a link that goes right to a particular local news source that will give me insight about this accident. So if I get the call five minutes later from CNN, I'll have some insights of the, about the accident that may not be in CNN's hands then. And again, it's a very 
a dynamic situation sometimes. And you have to tailor them for your specific circumstances. I happen to get a lot of uh, media opportunities when there's breaking news happening with plane crashes. So a lot of things I do online is to maximize my ability to be informed about those things when they happen. Now, what systems will you, will you use? Online resources. And again, the basic set of online things that people have, and we'll go into this a little bit later, is if you're online, you probably have an email account. You probably uh, done a little searching on the internet and you probably have a list of uh, favorite websites. Well, these are all basic things that, that you'll use. That is, if you want to be online, excuse me, if you want to be on the air in this day and age, it's almost essential that you have not only an online presence, but a capability to use the internet to your advantage. And just to give you a very, very simple example, a lot of the networks that are out there, CNN, Fox News, et cetera, actually have simulcast going online. So, for example, you might be able to do things, and I'm jumping ahead here. Let's say you know you're going to be on a particular radio program at a particular time. Let's say you also know they have a, a streaming um, audio, uh, an audio stream rather, going live over the air. Well, one of the things I've done over the years, I would call the producer ahead of time and say, hey, is it okay if I take the stream, record it, and then replay it later in my podcast? And they say, oh, yeah, no problem at all. So I might rush off to go do the radio interview set my computer up to record the stream, and not only did I have an opportunity to be on, on the air, but I also have an opportunity to take that, edit it, usually very little editing, just put it as is out there on the podcast, on videos, etc., so that I'm using technology as a leverage. The system I use were the built-in capabilities I have in my machine to record things. Sometimes I might add, add a few extra apps or a few extra probes to do that sort of thing. And again, I'm not very sophisticated at this, but over time, I figured, hey, so long as I have this capability, let me see if I can exploit it to expand my reach. Now, the system, some of the systems include, as we see in the uh, fourth, third bullet there, how you dress for the camera. Now, I'm not real big on fashion. I don't like to get dressed that much. However, I am not a fool in that I'm trying to fit in as much as possible when I go on the air. So uh, I don't make it a big, big uh, scientific effort. I just look at TV and say to myself, okay, here are the experts who are speaking about things that are vaguely like what I speak about. They are dressed in various ways. What seems to work for them? And I just sort of follow their, their example. And uh, you know, I have a joke with my family. I have my, my TV clothes and I have my regular clothes. And uh, if you see me dressed up in a coat and tie in the middle of the afternoon, I'm running around. It's usually because of a plane crash and it's a bad thing. But again, every profession is different. I'm a guy, I dress like a guy. Women have it harder, in my humble opinion, because there's all sorts of fashions all over the map for people on television. And again, if you look closely, especially if you're lucky enough to be in the studio like I have been with some folks, clothes people wear on the air are different from what you would see on the street. And again, if you're aware of this and you want to dress like people who are on TV and fit in, just pay attention next time you watch TV or the next time you're in a studio. Learn from the experts. How you provide the information is another system, and I'll get into it a little bit later. Uh, that is, you're an on-air expert. You know more about the subject than virtually everyone else you know of. You may be one of the top four or five people in the world on a particular thing, however narrow that expertise may be. However, television is not, television news especially, is not something where you have hours to expound on your area of expertise. You don't even have minutes. You may only have seconds. So part of the system I've created for myself is a system, frankly, for writing sound bites. That is, if I'm addressing various issues and I want to break it down into short segments that can be quoted, that is, if they're only going to take five to 10 seconds out of my interview and repost it somewhere, can I encompass decent information in a very short span of time without seeming hurried, without seem, seeming contrived, while seeming natural? It's a process. It takes some practice. Now, I'll actually go through that later on in this webinar. Back one, I talked about systems. Now we're going to talk about legal issues. There are a lot of legal issues. Some of the big ones I'll just touch on briefly. Defamation, which is slander or libel. And again, if you go on the air and you say something that's not true, you could be in trouble for a whole bunch of reasons. If you say something that's not true and that embarrasses an individual or an organization, you can be, in the United States at least, 
in, in civil trouble. That is, there might be a civil lawsuit against you. And without going into great detail, you really want to avoid those sorts of things. Basically, if you're going to go on t television and say something that is absolutely true, that can be backed up by objective observers and facts, or that you're, let's say, for example, restating factual information that's in the well known to the public, you're probably not going to be in trouble. Other than that, be careful. If you have any questions, go find a, a, a legal expert because I'm definitely not one. Fair use in public domain. This is more on the order of how you use other material, whether in your presentation or how you use that material afterwards. And again, as I explained before, I usually get permission before I use, um, let's say, a radio interview, let's say a 30 minute radio interview that I recorded online. But fair use is a strange concept that says basically, you can use small segments of almost anything depending on the context. And again, you're an on-the-air expert. Let's say you're using a photograph from uh, some, some source, that's a private source, but it's in the context of a news event and you're not really taking money out of the hands of that organization. You can use that sort of thing. But again, uh, just because you find it online doesn't mean you can free, freely use it. Copyright, that works both ways. One of the copyrights you want to be very careful of is your own copyright. That is, do you want to have what you're doing, something that you can take with you for a long time to come? Let's just uh, say that if you want to have a long-term presence online, very likely you're going to be producing text, audio, pictures, etc. That might be available online. Just go through the basic steps to maintain your copyright for it. That is, don't give it away for free. Don't tell people, oh, Download all my stuff. Use it any way you, you wish. Again, I'm no legal expert. Go out and do your own homework on how to maintain your own copyright. Employer issues. Again, if you happen to be working for a corporation or any sort of entity as an employee and you're doing something on behalf of the company, that's one situation. If you're an employee and you're doing something on behalf of yourself or on behalf of another company, let's say you're a consultant on the side, you have to tread very carefully. And without going into too much detail, my own story, I used to work at Boeing as an engineer, as a safety engineer, as a matter of fact. And I was doing things online while I was an employee. And the few times I had opportunities to go on the air or, or do newspaper interviews, that sort of thing, I made sure I was very clear with everyone involved that, hey, I'm representing myself, et cetera, not anyone else. I was in contact with the company legal department to make sure I was on the right side of things with them. And any information I used was information that was in the public domain. That is, anyone in the public could have had access to that information. Or it was facts and data that's not copyrightable, not owned by anyone. And I wasn't using any internal corporate uh, resources to make things happen. Regulatory issues. And again, it depends on your situation. Let's say you happen to be in the financial world as a, as a broker of some kind. And you're on the air touting how great the stock may be. And again, I'm not in that world. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not in the Securities and Exchange Commission, but in the process of you going on the air and talking about something, you could be running afoul of various regulations of an appropriate government agency. In my own case, I, I talk about aviation safety all the time, and the TSA, although they haven't gotten upset with me, I've said many things in the past that were not very charitable about the TSA, including one time when I, I didn't do a radio interview on it, I actually wrote several articles on it, of a document that was accidentally released by the TSA, which happened to be a security related document that had all sorts of things about how they set their metal detectors, that sort of thing. I found out about it because I found that document on an ABC News website. So I said to myself, well, gee, the cat's already out of the bag. This document, which was not supposed to be for the public's uh, perusal, is already in the public domain. So me reporting about this, uh, since I don't have a contractual relationship with the TSA to keep this information secret, I'm not in violation of any laws. And if they were going to come after me, they'd have to come after CNN, ABC, and a lot of other news organizations. But again, I didn't do this with a cavalier attitude. I sat down and had a conversation with myself and thought, okay, is it legal? Is it ethical? Am I in any way, shape, or form putting lives at risk by doing so? And the answer was no all down the line, so I went ahead and did it. And I put in the Department of Defense there because currently in the news, you had that uh, Army Private Bradley Manning, who released a lot of documentation to WikiLeaks. 
he was under an obligation to maintain the security of secret documents. He really sold secret documents to the public. He obviously is on trial for his life. But if you were a private citizen and happened to come across those same WikiLeaks documents, you're essentially under no obligation to keep those secure. So again, what you can say online or on the air depends on your circumstances. And the last thing on the list is the actual thing you'll say on the air. And why is the last on the list? If you haven't sat down to think through some of the other issues, then it's unlikely that you'll have a successful long-term effort at being on the air. Because if you don't think through these things or think about them constantly along the way, you'll probably trip over something and either not have any opportunities or not be invited back. And again, when it comes to what you will say, the actual mechanics of it, being on the air isn't enough. Being in a nice looking suit is enough. You have to say something that can be uh, useful, that can be informative. And again, that will encourage people to stick around past the next set of commercials. And again, my question I asked before, does it increase the good or decrease the bad? I don't want to bring in Paris Hilton into this, but there is obviously a person that is extraordinarily good at getting media. It's not media that necessarily, in my opinion, increases the good or decreases the bad whenever she does it, but it's definitely entertaining in a certain way. Do you want to be Paris Hilton or do you want to, want to be an on-air expert who's actually producing something for people that will be useful to them that they'll want to hear over and over again? And again, it's what you're doing motivating the team. Because again, if you don't have a team around you, at least the human part of the team could disappear or would be very hard to hold on to. Keys to long-term success, continuous marketing and outreach. In my own personal case, like I said, I have a website, a YouTube channel, podcast, also have a mailing list, Twitter account, Facebook. Not that I like all those things. I just happen to have all those things. They act as my 24-hour-a-day publicist. It's always out there displaying my wares, as it were. And anyone who's looking for things in the world of airline safety, by the way, go to Google, type in airline safety, see if you don't see me. Leverage of assets under your control. Again, what I said earlier about copyright and such. If you're a creative person in the sense of you're actually doing something as an expert that's useful to the world, and if you have control over that intellectual property, you can parlay that and use it in a hundred different ways. Uh, for example, I've written my, developed my website starting in 1995. It's been live since 1996. There are things in that website that were based on things I'd written five, ten years before. And most of the website's original content is still out there in one form or another. Some, some of it's been turned into videos and podcasts. I'm reusing, in an appropriate way, stuff I may have written 20, 25 years ago. And again, that's one kind of leverage. Management of those assets and those relationships. I work hard behind the scenes to make sure that I have a, a database where I can go get in touch with um, uh, people in the media I've dealt with in the past. I have an email account. I can search emails five, six, seven, eight years ago to come up with a producer's name at some network I worked at, worked with only once, but I'd like to work at again. Willingness to adapt to evolving media. When I started in 97, in 96 rather, you basically had email and the web as the two major parts of uh, what was online. You had a few rudimentary search engines, nothing like Google is now. The idea of having full motion video like a YouTube or even a podcast was just laughable because machines were so slow and it was very difficult to do any sort of multimedia. Of course, you see where we have seen what's happened since then. Typical kinds of on-air appearances, talking head remote appearance, where it's either through Skype, again, what I said earlier to uh, Stephen, I believe it was about Skype, wonderful tool that allows you to do a television interview remotely from anywhere in the world. You can be live in the studio, either live with the commentators and the anchors and whatnot, or you're in a studio in City A and headquarters in, is in City B and they have a camera trained on you. Same thing with radio. You can do a telephone call, call into the radio station. You can be in the studio itself. And you can do a conference call type radio show where there's like three or four of you from around the country or even around the world, and you're patched in. You have a nice live chat, uh, either on a local radio station, BBC, or whatever it may be. And again, it really doesn't matter how big the media outlet is. They're all using basically the same technology to get in contact with you, to put you on the air, et cetera. My own media journey, I look at the clock here, and I'm going a little bit further out than I thought. I'm going to make this quick. 
I grew up in the 70s in traditional media, a world where in the United States you had three broadcast television channels, no cable whatsoever, and a daily newspaper, and rare access to newspapers outside of my local area. As I grew up in my profession, I wanted to stand it amongst my peers, and you know, I did the traditional things to do that. That is, I had a relevant experience in my field, I published a few papers in various industry journals, I got academic degrees that were relevant to what I was doing, and I even wrote a book, Understanding Aviation Safety Data. Real page turner if you're into aviation safety data, but let's not go there right now. And the, one of the things that motivate me was, motivated me was, I would look at television, let's say after a plane crash, and I'd see these so-called experts, and I'd say to myself, my God, I can be better than that clown. Well, fast forward a few years, now I'm one of those clowns, and I still say to myself, am I really better than those guys? What do I have to do? to up my game. And again, that last point, going old school helped me out. I did the things in the pre-internet days that one had to do to stand out as an expert. And having that kind of discipline and that kind of background really helped me to stand out when I tried to go into the new media. And again, uh, my goal was to focus on my expertise, which was about plane crashes and such, finding willing media partners and doing outreach. Old-fashioned marketing. I would call people up. I would find an email address for a reporter at the end of an article. I'd send out an email. I'd say, look, hey, I've got this website. I've got some stuff here. I can answer some of your questions. If you have a question, feel free to call, contact me. I'll help you out. It didn't matter how big the market was. I don't care if it, it was an audience of 50 or 500,000. I would put the same sort of effort toward that as I would for a big market because the information didn't change doesn't change because of the audience. Yeah, I'll very quickly go through airsafe.com. If you go to the website itself, you could probably find a lot of this information. Um, basically, plane crashes were the thing that drove people to the site. By trial and error, using what little skill, few skills I had for going online back then, I figured out what worked. In the early days, social media was basically using email. As time went on, I tried other social media things as I came out. Usually not the first guy out the, uh, the shoot to try the stuff, but seeing if it worked for me. If it worked, I kept doing it. If it didn't, I stopped using it. And again, I use feedback, both traffic feedback, feedback from events like what we're doing today to see what works and what doesn't, what didn't. And my two biggest lessons from baseball, one of them is from Field of Dreams. For those of you who may have seen the movie or may not have seen the movie, one of the most famous lines in there is, if you build it, he will come was whispered out of the ether to this farmer. Wasn't quite sure who he was talking about who would come, but he was compelled to build his baseball field in the middle of nowhere. And these magical ghosts of baseball players past would come out of the cornfield and play a game. One of the baseball players happened to be his father. That was the person he was building it for. But my point here is just because you have some shining baseball field in the middle of nowhere doesn't mean you'll have ghosts of the past or the present coming out to play with you. You have to have that field, but you also have to do marketing for that field. Tell people where the field is, when it's open, what kind of concessions you have, what kind of players you'll have. Give some backstory on the players. Give people an incentive to come to your particular ball field. And again, uh, having a public profile that is with the website really helped me. And like I told you earlier about how I worked with the corporation to make sure I was uh, doing the right thing. I sat down with the company lawyer, made sure that I was okay with them and he was okay with me. And I did a few basic things that made it easy on me. The biggest basic thing was I made absolutely sure I used data that was mine or that was publicly available. I didn't use any company resources. I did it on my own time. I used my own money. And one of the inspirations I had was from the intelligence community where I very, had a very, very short career in one of the intelligence agencies. And the one big lesson I found from my time there is it doesn't matter how complicated the technology, some of the very best intelligence out there is lying out there in the open. It's a question of knowing what to look for and how to look for it. That was the key to gathering that intelligence and making it useful. Now, we have literally a less than a minute left in this, and I'm afraid I'll have to cut this short. So uh, I'll say this. The entire um, um, webinar will be online, will be available later on. 
And I'll also have a PDF file of this uh, available for those of you who want to look at this uh, the slides later on. And uh, let's see now, big moments in my, in my journey toward the media, something called the New York Times test. Years before the internet, uh, I had a professor when I was a grad student, we wrote a paper, happened to be featured on the, in the New York Times on the front page. Saturday Night Live did a joke about it. And I said to myself, sitting there watching the show, it's like, my God, they're making fun of me on national television. Can I stand the attention I'm getting now that this has happened? The answer was, yes, I could. And you have to answer that question for yourself. If you're successful in doing what you want to do, are you going to be willing and able to withstand the pressure that will come from this increased attention? If you get your wish and you actually get on television or the radio and people you know and people you don't know hear you and critique you, either congratulate you or try to stick a knife in your back, are you going to be able to deal with that, that pressure? If the answer is yes, you've passed the New York Times test. Another big watershed, Flight 800, which those of you may remember was in 1996, happened two weeks after I launched the website. That day, I got a factor of 20 increase in online traffic to the site, which for me was one of those big lessons for my area of expertise, what things attracted people's attentions. So that was a foundational event in that from then on, I very much uh, had my online presence and my media presence uh, based on the attention that got generated with planes crash. When those things happened, I made sure I was aware of it. I took steps to get attention to myself. Once, uh, about 12, 13 years ago, in fact, I was working in, a, in an online company. I was in the, the first internet bus back in 2000. And I got a call out of the blue from a lawyer who said, oh, I have a client who doesn't like what you wrote about his airline. I told him, okay. Is anything about what I wrote incorrect? No, they just don't like what you said. I said, fine, thank you very much, and I hung up the phone. My first thought was, I haven't broken any laws. There's no libel, there's no slander. This is all factual data that's available to the public. But I can't afford to have a legal entity sue me and take what few assets I had. So that was a day I started thinking in a corporate way. That is, I did what I was doing online in such a way that I was legally protected from that kind of attack. And I also became much more formal in how I went about systematically building my offline and online presence. Another watershed event, again, I've been doing the website for several years, been reaching out to small newspapers, even did a couple of local TV things where I was giving some comment on something or another. One day, in fact, it was a Friday, uh, the, the day before Thanksgiving in 1999, out of the blue, I got a call from Fox News. They said, hey, would you like to come on and talk about Thanksgiving travel safety? Don't know how they found me. I had not worked with a Fox News affiliate at all, and I had no friends at Fox News, but they did find me. And that was a couple of lessons for me. A, being on a national show was very much like being on a local show in that the information didn't change. And in fact, the kinds of studio I was in, a remote studio, was pretty much the same as for a local television station. And the other thing was that on a uh, long weekend, the usual suspects are out of town and unavailable. If you're trying to break in to being on the air, whether it's radio or TV, a time of a long weekend or a long vacation or a long holiday, a big holiday, is an excellent time to get the attention of someone. The last one I'd like to mention is uh, aviation safety was my thing. Bird strikes the aircraft was one of my areas of expertise within the aviation community. I worked with an organization called the uh, Bird Strike Committee USA, and I've always told them, look, one of these days, we're going to have the mother of all bird strikes. They'll take down an airplane in front of a bunch of cameras, in front of a major media market. On that day, every reporter in the universe is going to want to talk to some expert. I want them to talk to the experts within our community. So I convinced them to put uh, a website up to have contact information for the major players in the bird strike community available there. So that 24 seven, something happened and every reporter went to Google, looked up bird strikes, they would come to our website. That day happened back in 2009 with the miracle on the Hudson, Sully Sullenberger with the A320 that hit the flock of geese out of LaGuardia and landed in the Hudson. Hudson River, a mile away from the greatest concentration of English speaking news media on the planet earth. It worked like a charm. All the folks who should have been contacted by the media were contacted by the media, several of them for the very first time getting an opportunity to go on national and international television or radio. 
it worked like a charm. And again, what worked for Bird Strike Committee USA can work for you as an individual as well. Be prepared for the opportunity. Take advantage of it when it comes. Now, very quickly, the caveman and the spoon parable, what JFK would say about new technology, and the advantages of being the first or the second or slower mover when it comes to technology. Once upon a time, I had a cell phone, old time cell phone, didn't have any internet or anything. And one day I got a Blackberry. I'm sitting there, punching away at it, trying to figure out how to program this Blackberry, squinting my eyes, you know, having real problems with it. My young son looks over at me and says, Dad, you look like a caveman with a spoon. Now, on the one hand, I was upset with the kid because he was absolutely right. I did feel like a caveman with a spoon. But on the other hand, I said to myself, you know, what's wrong with being a caveman with a spoon? Caveman starts with fairly crude technology, a big old stick in the sand, as you see. And suddenly he, or his cavewoman friend, gets introduced to the concept of a spoon. Well, gee, what can I do with this spoon? It's not as big as a club, but can it do things that a club can't? And having that attitude, that is, dragging yourself out of whatever technological world you're in right now to embrace a new technology, you have to ask yourself something. What about this technology? What relationship should I have with it? That's where we come to JFK. A little historical fact here. First televised presidential debate was in 1960. John F. Kennedy versus Richard Milhouse Nixon. From what I hear, I was too young to see this at the time. From what I hear, people who heard the debate on radio thought they were pretty evenly matched. People who watched on television thought that Kennedy won hands down. Among other things, Nixon didn't look good under the lights. He was sweaty, etc., etc. So to paraphrase, or actually to play around with a famous JFK quote, ask not what you think of the people who are using that, tech, that technology. Ask rather, what can that technology do for you? Now, I don't know what Nixon and Kennedy thought about television, but it was a new medium. I do know when it comes to new medium and new technology, let's say like Twitter and YouTube, when they first came out, there was a whole lot of hype on the internet usually about, oh, look at all this wonderful thing we can do with this. Twitter, 140 characters. It's like, I'm not a geek. I have a life. I refuse to waste time with Twitter. There came a point where I had to sit back and say to myself, I have to stop thinking about how I feel about the people who use that technology. I have to think about how can that technology help me? And when I sat down with things like Twitter, there were actually some very limited things that Twitter does wonderfully well. And I started using Twitter religiously after that. But I first had to get off of the idea of I'm you know, downplaying or denigrating the people using this technology because I don't like the way they look. I don't like their long hair. I don't like their geeky attitude. And they're just wasting time. I'd rather be doing real work. And again, ask not what you think about the people using the technology. Ask what the technology can do for you. Now, first and second mover advantage. Depending on the technology, it may be an advantage to be a first mover. It may be an advantage to be a slower mover. That is, wait until a few people jump off of the bandwagon before you jump on. Twitter, for me, was one of those. I heard about it. I didn't think much of it. I waited around to see if Twitter would stick. And I said, OK, there's been some experience using this. There have been some reasonable people talking about it. How can I take what they've said, twist it around, and then use Twitter for my own advantage? First mover advantage. Way back in the day, when websites were new, airsafe.com got lost when they were, got launched, and there were fewer than a million websites out there. There's uh, you know several hundred million websites out now. At the time, I didn't know if websites would work. I didn't know if it would be a flash in the pan. But it was fairly cheap to get in. There wasn't very many people competing for what I was doing. I figured, what the heck? I've got some free time. I'll try it out. So sometimes it helps to be first. Sometimes it helps to be second. But it doesn't help you to ignore it. Because technology is your team member. If you find things that will work for you, be it Google, be it uh, search engines, be it uh, whatever, use it. Now, uh, in short, if you're going to start doing this, if you're going to be online in the media, have a conversation with yourself. Ask yourself why you're going to do this. Go through that eight-point uh, checklist I gave earlier. Have a basic online presence. Go out there and do your, your, your LinkedIn or your Facebook, your Twitter account. Have a Skype account on standby because it allows you to communicate with people for free around the world, and it could be used to actually do interviews. 
and prepare for your on-air opportunity. If you're an expert, if you have stuff online already, leverage that, you know, have links to it on your LinkedIn page. Go out and find somebody who's writing about this subject and then contact them and say, look, I know something about this subject. You're writing another article? Contact me. Real basic things. It's not complicated. Just work your way up the ladder. And I talked about the basic online presence before. All of these can be done without spending any money. For the several email addresses, I won't go into detail, but I do have some resources I'd like to direct you to that goes into that. Using search engines, another basic skill you should have, as well as basic email etiquette. And bringing news opportunities to you. I talked about Google Alerts earlier. Also, if you have an online presence that the news people can find, they can come to you rather than you trying to find them all the time. Build on what you already have. If you already have published articles, have links to them. If you have a company, a media outlet, a, a, who, who does this sort of thing, work with them to get your stuff promoted. Go get big and go small. No matter how big or how small the media outlet, it's going to be the same process. You're going to be giving the same information. You'll probably be sitting in the same studios. So don't treat CNN, in a sense, different from, from you would a, uh, the way you would treat a local television outlet. Be prepared to call and write. That is, don't just rely on the internet to do your work for you. Do some of the traditional person-to-person -person contact with the producers, with the writers, with the reporters, with the television camera people to make this happen. And invite people into whatever network you have. If you happen to have a mailing list for your website, have them join the mailing list, something I'm going to ask all of you to do. If you have uh, LinkedIn, they have LinkedIn, hey, invite them to go to LinkedIn. Like their Facebook, have them like your Facebook. Follow them on Twitter. Do all the things you would do with the rest of your audience as you would with the media audience. You want them part of what you're doing on an ongoing basis. Be prepared to answer any question that's reasonable. Be prepared to answer more questions if you get the opportunity. Get briefed by the producer before you go on so you don't go out there naked. Answer the questions they need to have answered. Make sure their audience Get something satisfactory out of your experience. And if you don't think you can handle it, if you don't think you have what, that, what, what you need to offer, then say no. You can say no before the interview. You can refuse to answer a question during the interview. If the host gets rude or what have you, you know, uh, do your diplomatic best not to go there. Dress appropriately. I talked about that earlier. Practice if you can. If you have a laptop, desktop, you got, you know, ability to record your voice, to record photographs to record video, do that with yourself, practice in front of your own mirror, so to speak, and see how you look and promote yourself by any means. Last thing, very, very, very important. One lesson I want you to come away with, the art of doing a soundbite. The world of on-air entertainment and news is short attention span theater. If you're long-winded, you're going to be cut off. They're not going to listen to you. And I came up with a concept for how to write a soundbite. I'm a professional media guy. This is my own idea. It's like, it's got to be short. A couple of ideas at most, and only one number. So I can have two ideas, a single idea, an idea plus a number, or a single number. But I'm not going to have two numbers. I'm not going to have three ideas. I was a big rodeo fan growing up. A couple of my favorite events was wild bronc riding and wild bull riding, where if you didn't stay on at least eight seconds, it didn't count. Well, this is the opposite. If you go over eight seconds, you're going to fail. So this is a rodeo time sort of analogy. You have eight seconds to make something happen. Not more than eight, less than eight. And if you have a long answer or you have to prepare for a long answer, break it down into several sound bites. So if they had to pull only one section of your answer out and replay it on the air, that section would be a self-contained sound bite. That would make sense. Last thing before I go, overpromise and underdeliver. That way you're not going to make your audience upset. You're not going to make yourself upset. Keep your own perspective. You're an on-air expert. You're not Paris Hilton. Channel Nancy Reagan. If need be, just say no. Remember, the mic is always hot. The camera never blinks. And everything is on the record. And with that, I'd like to invite you all to uh, go to further information. Uh, media.airsafe.com has related information, including a couple of books that you can download for free. 
book I wrote called Parenting in the Internet that has some how-tos of how to use search engines, how to do basic email etiquette. So if you're weak on that or don't really understand it, plenty of stuff there. Uh, there's also another book, the airsafe.com podcasting production manual, which has the eight points I talked about earlier in the context of building a podcast. Subscribe to the mailing list at subscribe.airsafe.com. And if you have feedback, feedback.airsafe.com. Thank you all very much. And if there are any questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I'll be in contact soon with links to the video from this webinar. Any questions? By the way, we're massively over time. I think it's an hour and 15 total recording time. I do hope the system I have actually recorded the whole thing. And this will be on YouTube in a day or two. I see no hands raised. Let's see, let me go to the chat area. No chat, no questions. All right, I thank you very much for your time. And I do hope that time was spent usefully.